So welcome into another episode of Suds with Luds. And uh, first is on the Dub Network. And I want to make sure I thank again our partners over here, uh, Ryan Hammer and all the guys over at uh, Herman Marshall Whiskey and Bourbon and Booze. And if anybody gets a chance, make sure you stop out in Wiley, Texas and visit their tasting room. They got a good little gig going on there. We've we've made a couple little pit stops over there and uh, they got it going on. And they're going to, I think they're going to be up and running. They're going to have a stage and down the street and some concerts and things like that. So again, thanks much to Herman Marshall. Um, I got a bottle sitting next to me and I don't have no glass to put anything in. So uh, today, um, you know, I've said I've had some some special guests here at the time and uh, I've had Hall of Famers on the show and plumbers and garage guys. This guy's none of those. He falls into the Hall of Fame category. He's in a couple different ones. But I would describe him as a as an icon, especially here in Dallas. Today we welcome Michael Thomas Madonna Jr. <laughs> Mo, how you doing? I'm good, lads. It's good, good to, to see, see you. you, Mo. Um, you look like you just got done playing about a week and a half ago. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm assuming living in Arizona keeps you busy and golfing and all that kind of stuff. Yes. And, uh, you know, a seven to seven shift shift with five kids, you know, we don't sit down till, uh, well after 8 PM. So it's, it's a lot of calories, uh, burning. You don't even know it. So we, we have some hard days here. So we're, we're right in the thick of things, as you know. So <clears throat> we got, uh, five kids, two, eight, six, four, and two. So we're, well, we'll I want to tell you something. I don't know if you're going to remember this. Con- First off, how's Allie doing? How, how's she doing? Is she getting she getting to swing the club as much as she used to, or as much as she'd like to? Uh, uh, occasionally, and uh, we get out once in a while. Now that we have five going to school from uh, at least eight thirty to three, so we do have a little breather there. Um, but that's the quickest five hours of our life when we don't have any kids around. So we get to enjoy. Uh, we have the day dates, we call it. So, but she's. She's a trooper. It sounds like you. It sounds like you got. Uh, hey, you got five kids. You don't need any spare time here. You, you should just stop uh, where you're at. Listen, I remember I a conversation. Know. I I was talking to you, and I think you were. This had to be 10, 10 years or so ago. I remember you were around forty, and I was talking about my kids, and I said, "Mo, when are you going to have some kids?" I said, "Dude, I'm just going to tell you. It, it's nice having them when they're young, and you can still get around, and you know you can do things with them, and all that kind of stuff." And Next thing I find out, you're you're not taking a day off for what six seven years. I mean, you're just giving her enough time to recuperate and let's get back at it, baby. I know she she doesn't let me live that down. So I, I you know she didn't couldn't come up for air. She was just uh, you know eight kids in uh, the ten years we've known each other. It's five kids in ten years, so she's just been you know pregnant or raising kids or something. Finally, we, we've, we've taken a step back. We've, we've figured out what's been happening. So we fixed that. So we've, uh, we're, uh, we're good and clear there. So no more coming around anymore. So we're, we're clear, but, uh, yeah, I've got, I've got a late start and I talked to guys like yourself and even Billy Garen, all their kids are out of college. I'm like, Oh, they're just traveling. Yeah. You know, he's heading off to Spain and Italy in the off season. And, you know, we're, we're going to, YMCA and hockey camps in, in Colorado. So we, we're, our lives are extremely different right now. So Jack and Kate, the twins are the oldest, correct? And they mm-hmm. are what, nine, 10, somewhere in that neighborhood? They'll be nine this July. Okay. Uh, Reese is six. She'll be seven in uh, August. Luca's four. He'll be five in uh, October. And Quinny's two. She'll be three in August as well. So, so you're going to... When when a couple of your kids are graduating, they're going to be wheeling you in in a wheelchair <laughs> to go to graduation. That's what uh, that's what Kate, the oldest twin, says. You know, we'll we'll, we'll just wheel you in to, to see our graduation at some point or my wedding. I'm like, yeah, oh boy. Well, the good news is, is when they get into shit, at least you're going to forget about it. You won't remember anything going on. You're going to think they're all great kids. So yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you. So your wife, Allison. Um, Pro golfer was a pro golfer at the time, I believe, when you met her. Um, mm-hmm. Her father, Joe Micheletti, uh, doing TV still, uh, played in the NHL, doing TV still, um, involved with the New York Rangers, uh, which they've. Uh, it sounds when I listen to the broadcast, he's he's very happy. They got a good, exciting team um, going mm-hmm. on now. Did you ever? Did Joe ever try to offer you? I don't know who would ever offer you any advice, but um, even when you're going through contract. Uh, negotiations, thing like that. Did ever did, did did the dad, the father-in-law ever get involved in any of that kind of stuff? He just kind of mind his own thing. 
Um, no, he, he's pretty involved. Even, even to this day, you know, he's just a smart guy. I mean, he's, he's very, very smart guy. I mean, he's just a great guy. I think, you know, like I said, I've known him since probably 18 years old when he was coming into Minnesota to do our games on uh, TV from St. Louis. He was commuting with Dave Hodge and, and uh, was it uh, Dave Shannon, those guys when they were doing the TV when, when Norm owned the team. So, uh, he was commuting from St. Louis to do our, our TV game. So I've, I've known him a good long time, and uh, he's always a treat to talk to. And, and still to this day, we, we talk all the time. So he's just he's a fun guy. I, I head out to his member guest uh, in New York in the summer. And, you know, but he's uh, he's uh, he's a polished guy. He just yeah. he's, he's been there, done it all. And, you know, he's seen a lot of things. But, uh, you know, more than anything, he's just a uh, he's a great, great guy. Great, uh, great father in law. He, he's definitely polished. He still looks like he's 45 years old. So he's either got a, a, a really good, uh, uh, what's that, the collagen guy or the, the hair and makeup guys. But, you know, all those guys, I mean, let, let's face it, we got one here in Dallas, right? Razor is always that, that guy, too. They, they make, these guys make sure they look good. They know, they know what they have to look like when they get on TV. Yeah, yeah. They've been, they, he's, he's been on TV a long, long time. And, and, but he studies hard. I've never seen a color guy, maybe close to Razor, that those two guys. I, I, you know, watching them, they prep like no other. He's watching games. He's taking notes. You, you, you figure at this time in their career, they could just, you know, knock yeah. it off with uh, at the top of their head and just uh, spit out whatever they want out. But they, you know, he, they all kind of dig deep. They find something that's uh, not talked about number wise, stats, analytics, something that, uh, you know, not everybody knows about, just to kind of give some. Uh, you know, some uh, some clarity, some variety to it instead of getting so vanilla. And they've been able to, you know, recreate themselves over the years, which makes them very, uh, very successful. They're fun to watch, fun to listen to. You know, on that note, you, you dipped your toe in the water a little bit, didn't you? Didn't, you were doing some stuff with the NHL Network, I think it was at one time. It didn't sound like that was right down your alley, though. How, how did How did you, what was your experience with it? It was it was hard off the get go because I went out there to do the first round of playoffs and so you have a ton of games so there's you know eight ten games going on at one time at one night so I kind of got thrown into the fire and 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 so the the other issue was we're in Toronto and there was probably two or three series on the West Coast on LA time so they wouldn't get started until <laughs> maybe ten thirty eleven on the East Coast so we're in the studio till well into three three thirty in the morning because you have to roll some beat some beat tape that's going to just get replayed in the morning all the highlights and everything else that everybody's going to watch from like eight in the morning you know till noon on the nhl network so it was it was uh, it was tough to say the least i mean it was just you know the names getting out of the description of the play describing what's going on all in a you know a nanosecond so you really didn't have time to just to describe the play you know so i needed a little time to kind of build up and all of a sudden they're off to the next uh highlight so i'm like you know, so it was uh, it was kind of uh, thrown into the into the fire there right off the start. So it it was a it was a tough one. Then I went back in October um, for the kickoff season in Boston. Um, you know, I think that was when Boston had won the finals that year. So uh, you know, we started off the season again. So we're talking all about all the divisions and the teams, and you know, and I'm I'm screwing up the divisions and what teams and whats, and I'm like, oh, it was just it, it was not a good experience for the first two times. So did they ask you, I mean, when it was all done with, did they want you to come back and did you just politely decline? <laughs> I politely declined. I'm like, I, I'll come in when you have maybe two games a night, you know, yeah. those slow nights when they kind of get a filler in that, uh, you know, that Dave Reed does. Maybe I'll come do Dave Reed's night when they have two or three games and I can kind of handle that. But uh, that full load like that was those nights, that was tough. So, and, uh, you know, the commute, now they're in New York, which is a little better because you had to go to Toronto and I can just go to, you know, outside New York, which was a little better commute. But, uh, They've always left an open invite, and I'm, I've kind of left that alone. Yeah, I kind of parked that. Yeah, I, I let me tell you, I, I did it for a little bit. The the, the in studio stuff was okay because you, like you said, you have time to look at things and you got your missions. Mm -hmm. But the live stuff that I was doing with Razor and Razor was so good to me. He held my hand, but man, when you think you know every player in the NHL, and all of a sudden a number comes flying up, and you're like, uh, uh, and then you don't. Yeah, so I just found the studying for me was, was just ridiculous. I I had a hard time with it. But anyway, let's let's talk about. Little Mikey, I, I'm I'm curious about. I, I saw some stuff when when you were just a young kid. You were, and which just surprised the hell out of me that 
It said Mike wasn't a very well-behaved kid, which that just does <laughs> not describe you whatsoever. So how did you – this had part of how you got into hockey, though, right? I mean, so you weren't that good in school. What was going on? Um, well, I was just, you know, very – high energy kid, you know, at five, six, seven years old, I just couldn't find anything to kind of keep my attention. Baseball just wasn't cutting it. Everything else. I had a dirt bike. I had, you know, we had a boat go skiing. We, you know, I loved my dirt bike. We're out in the, in the, in the country in Michigan outside Detroit. So I love that. Just love being outdoors and, and doing everything. So I really couldn't find anything that just kind of kept me my attention and kept me, uh, Gave me an opportunity to build out, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, get rid of some steam and some energy. So my dad was really into construction. He was building a lot of homes in the Detroit area. Um, he had three brothers that would come in the summertime and work for him in the summer after their school year was over. Two of them were at Michigan State playing college hockey, and one was at Fort Wayne playing semi-pro, and they're all brothers, Jack, Mike, and Bobby Rankin. And... Uh, you know, sometimes I would come on the weekends to uh, his projects and kind of hang out and, you know, just be a little bit of a, a run around kid. How old are you now? This was uh, probably just turned seven that year. Okay. Just, that was just my, my June 77, just turned seven. So that summer I was at hanging out around the houses and and uh, being a run around kid at the properties and stuff. So, um, you know, my dad was always in hearing the stories about these guys coming back from, you know, their college and hockey and he was a big hockey fan he grew up in boston so he's a big bruin fan back in the or and Buchek days and esposito and those guys so he he knew a little bit about the game and and uh he just kept telling these guys guys this mike gets kicked out of school we got to go pick him up and this is all in you know this is first grade stuff you know it's just like you know uh, but I haven't seen a first grade kid that's not crazy that's off the rails at, at some point. You know, everybody thinks he's got ADD, but I'm like, I think every kid has ADD at some point. Um, and now they have a, a legal name to it. But back then it was just hypertension, you know, a hyperactive yeah. kid. So um, the oldest one, Jack, who is in Fort Wayne uh, with the comments, said, Jess, oh, I just take him skating, maybe try hockey, you know, maybe you can kind of get some energy out that way. And, and so, uh, probably a month later they had like these little summer drop-ins thing and we went over to waterford uh ice arena uh lakeland and waterford and um you know it was instant i went skating once and that uh, that was it i just went took it to you know uh dog on a bone i just could not get enough of it went all day we started going all you know every chance i could go to this drop do you remember your here. first day first day on skates yeah, went to, you know, uh, uh, God, I think, I think it's Bob Pirani, a big, uh, sports store in, uh, in Detroit, but his only store was at Waterford at Lakeland Ice Arena at that point. And he had a bunch of used stuff in the back. He's like, you know, tell my dad, come on back. We'll just, you know, we'll fit him some, for some skates. And, you know, so it was all just ragtag gear. I just threw it on and, and, you know, those old black CCM tacks and, um went out there and that was it i was like wow i was like you know I, I just couldn't get enough of it so then i wanted to do it at home out in the street i was watching you know obviously hockey night in canada we were close to canada so we get channel nine and and cbc so watching a ton of maple leafs and montreal canadians back in the day and and uh getting down to any red wing games we could at olympia at the time before joe opened up so um, yeah, it was just, it was just instantaneous and, and then that was it. And then that's that fall, uh, we were living on a lake, you know, we'd clear out the lake pond hockey. Uh, we had a, my mom came out and built like a little rink in the backyard. Cause I kept falling in the rink in the, in the pond. She's like, no more skating on the pond, you know, let's build a rink in the backyard. So we did that. And so I was out there all day, every day at seven, eight, nine. And uh, then got into, you know, more structured hockey at uh, my second year. And and then my third year was introduced to the whole Little Caesars program at nine years old and Pee Wee. So, and that just took it to a whole nother level. I think I was with them for, had to have been six or seven years with that program and, and Mike Illich. So that just whole, changed the whole thing. So, um, you know, I, I, I still talk to Jack Rankin quite a bit. 
you know, and he knows he was he was the guy that got uh, he got me in ho- involved in hockey. He kind of lets everybody know that too. So it was it was just a just a random thing. I just and, and it was instant. So I, I, I at that point I just I couldn't get enough of it. Yeah, and I could see going through Little Caesars, and you know, with our U eighteen team, we we run into them. They've been around it seems like forever, and mm-hmm. a lot of, a lot of players have come out of that program and done a hell of a job there in Detroit. So so you go through that you play there till what 15 16 and mm-hmm. and you get and there's a couple of names as we talk are going to keep popping up and and one of them is Rick Wilson and and I know mm-hmm. that you got a call from Wils apparently um asking if you were interested in going to play in PA Prince Albert um and I, I'm just curious how how did Wils get a hold of you and uh how did that conversation go with you and Rick Wilson um well, it evolved after my last year of midget hockey with Caesars. We were 15, you know, 15 at the time. We had a big midget tournament, the Max tournament in Calgary, and we went out there and we just we just rolled through. Man, we had a, just a great team. You know, we had a bunch of 16, 17-year-old, 17-year-old kids too that went on to college, but we just had an amazing team and we just kind of we went in there and just had a great tournament and I think um, Rick at the time was working with the Simpson brothers and Wayne was a scout for the Prince Albert Raiders. And, um, but that summer I came home, we had another tournament in Hull in Quebec that we did really well in, which and is so a huge my, tournament, huge tournament. So my original plan was to go to Hull. They had called, I was watching La Fontaine and Jimmy Carson in Detroit. They went to Verdun and Laval and, you know, they come back and I, you know, we were, my parents didn't really didn't know what to do, so we, we we picked their brain a lot about the Quebec Junior League, and they're like, oh, you'll love it. It's it's just up and down hockey. It's offense. I'm like, God, it's like right down my alley. You know, there wasn't a lot of – no, not much fighting. It wasn't physical, which was, <laughs> again, perfect for me at the time. So it was just a drag match out there, a drag meet. So um, the night before – what happens in Quebec and Ontario, they have a, uh, an entry level draft. So you can draft 15 year olds in the first or second round. So I had a verbal agreement with the Hull Olympics at the time. And I think Wayne was, Gretzky was involved with them. Uh, Pat uh, Burns was actually coaching back then. And so, um, um, but the issue was the Quebec and Ontario league was the same day. The draft was the same day. So I committed verbally to Quebec to Hull the night before we were supposed to go to Hull, uh, they called and changed their mind at like three in the morning. So I was on the couch in our family room. I couldn't sleep. I was just nervous and I could hear the conversation going on in the kitchen. And, um, you know, so they were, my parents just were, they hung up the phone and they just didn't know how they were going to tell me that mm. this didn't happen. It just fell apart. So, and then at that point, we're too late to go to Ontario because they had all their verbal decisions made up so that my other call was just to go to windsor or play in london um and so neither came up so now i'm thinking i'll go to prep school in detroit at this cranbrook high school because high school hockey at detroit was was fairly pretty good at the time um but i didn't want to go to prep school i would have had this move away from school i didn't want to go there i just wanted to go at this point i want to go to canada i'm too young to get recruited for college I had talked to Red Berenson, Ron Mason at State in Michigan. So that was my logical choice to go to a couple years later, but it didn't work out. I was like, I I need to go play. And then it was almost like a week later, we get a call from uh, Bill LaForge out in New Westminster. And he's like, we got you on our player protective list. Now they do a player protective list in in Western Iowa. What, 15 years old, right? 15 years old. They got 50 players on a list. If they see someone at 10, they think is going to be great at 16. They put the name on it, facts around the league. So everybody knows that they're property of this so-and-so. So I was with New West Minister. And so I had a fella making some calls and just kind of inquiring about New West Minister. He came back. He said, God, they're they're really financially in trouble. You know, rumor is they're going to fold and probably move. Well, they did move eventually to Tri-Cities. And um, so I tell him, I, you know, tell LaForge, I'm like, well, I'm, I'm going to stay home. I'm going to stay in Detroit for another year. And and so um, probably a few days later, they dropped me from their list. Prince Albert picks me up. Okay. So then Rick calls me about 10 days later. This was 
probably towards the end of June. Um, Had you and, committed uh, to your high school program then? In the meantime, no. Okay. I didn't want to go, so I, and I had to take a entry level entry test to get in. And it's one of those fill in the blank things, A, B, C, D, okay. multiple questions. And I and I just figured out how I could make some nice lazy Z's around the thing. I didn't even read the questions. I, you know, it's a three hour test. I was done in 45 minutes, close the thing. I was out. I'm like, I knew I wasn't going and I didn't want to go. So I just figured I'd just flunk the test and they wouldn't accept me anyway. So, um, but then Rick calls and, and it's like, God, you know, we're, uh, we're in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. He's trying to explain, give me the pitch about PA and, you know, their location, their team. And, you know, we, we just, we'd love to just bring you up for a weekend, show you the town. If you like it, we'd, we'd love you to stay. And, and, um, you know, I said to my mom, I said, go get me some Chester fields. We're packing up all my stuff. I'm, I'm not going to come back. You know, if I go, I'm not leaving. And so we, uh, Talked to some people. I talked to Dave Manson. He was up there. Kenny Baumgartner, and you know, just some some characters. Emmanuel Viveros, uh, Pat Linick was there. So I, you know, Rick gave me all their phone numbers. We cha- talked, and 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 then at that point, I'm like, let's go. So we went to drove to Windsor, Windsor to Toronto, Toronto to Saskatoon. Two, uh, you know, two and a half hours up to PA, and it's just one of those drives. I'm like, wow, where are we going? And uh, we get into town and it's just, you know, 22,000 people. And, you know, I, I think the the blessing in disguise was I was 15. I had no idea. I didn't know any better. I didn't know where I was going. So like, you know, um, so that that kind of made it easier to kind of just roll in. Well, there and just Mo, kinda, it, yeah. it sounds like to me that I, I one of my questions I was going to ask you, were, were you apprehensive? Were you scared? going to another country and playing hockey? Obviously, the answer was no. How were your parents? I mean, were they cool with it? Said, hey, he he's good. We're, we're sending him off at 15 years old. I don't know if a lot of people understand what happens in Canada with hockey and things like that. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it would seem like at, you know, being on a protected list at 11, 12 years old or whatever it may be, that mm-hmm. how big it actually is. Yeah, my, I, I think my parents had heard a, enough from people in Detroit to know that this could be worth taking a chance for, for Mike, you know, this really is kind of, he's, you know, he's at this point, we feel competition wise, he can probably go in there and, and, and see where this goes. The catch was once you go there and start playing, you start getting per diem, you lose your eligibility at NCAA. So I couldn't come back home. So I knew once I made that choice, I was, I was there for good, but I got there and I just like, wow, this is, was just, the guys were so good. So I, about two days later, I went out went out for drop in hockey, and Dave Manson, I, I come down the boards, and he steps up on me, he, yeah. and this is just shitty hockey. This is summer. He's going off to the Blackhawks camp in about a week. I mean, he pitchforks me, picks me up, and just lifts me up and drives me into the into the glass, and I'm thinking. What have I gotten wow, this, myself into? Where, where am I at? And that time, you know, they didn't like, they called us Yankees. They didn't want us coming up. There's because there was Taking no jobs. Americans. Yeah. No Americans playing in that league uh, at all until I got up there. So that was kind of the first one. So they really kind of made it hard and tough. And, and uh, I, you know, I think looking back, I was appreciative that they were so nasty and tough because the league was tough. The, the, the travel, the hockey, it was just a real bear the weather up there just the surroundings and and but i loved it i ended up staying my summers up there had a bunch of great friends in high school and it was just uh you know the best two two and a half years of my life i just i just loved it well it just so if people if people don't know dave manson his nickname was charlie so you can go ahead and piece it together <laughs> go ahead google charlie manson you'll know why he was called charlie so um, and it's yeah. a guy, it's a guy that can give you that kind of stuff, but then, you know, he's got your back the next time around if it, if it works like that. But, it, but again, I'm, I'm seeing that it seems like a lot of this stuff came easy for you. Like whether it was little Caesars or then when you go to junior, because you played what, two and a half years, you had 108 goals and 294 points in two and a half years at, in, in junior. So there's no, there, there's no surprise then where you end up getting drafted uh, where mm-hmm. I'm assuming, is it, is it like. Was it like then the way it is now? Right now it's Connor Bedard, right? In, in the draft for this year, mm-hmm. his name has been out there for two years. Before that, it was Connor McDavid. 
Was your name being thrown around that you were hearing that entire time that you were there also, similar to what's going on now? Yeah, it, it, it's not quite to this level, I think, because he's just got you know, this this whole, you know, the, you know, the internet, the social media thing. Everybody knows everybody about everybody at the time. And I think at that particular moment in, uh, in 87, uh, going into 88 was our first real experience in international hockey at the World Juniors in Moscow. So I had gone there. I was there with, uh, you know, Jeremy Roenick, I think, was there on our Team USA. Johnny LeClaire. Um, we had a handful of guys, but, you know, Trevor Linden was on Canada. Wayne McBean, um, you know, they they had a real great team, too. And and so we we had played each other a couple times in, in the World Junior. So it wasn't until we got back to PA and Med- and, and Trevor was in Medicine Hat that the, the Central sca- Scouting uh, ratings came out, and we were just kind of like, just neck and neck, like 1A, 1B, we're kind of just doing this flip-flop thing from January till almost June. And then you had Curtis LeCision in there, who was the third pick from Saskatoon. So it was kind of the first really one, two, three picks in a draft that came from the first in the same league. So, um, but it was Trevor and I kind of the rest of the way in and and we really didn't know who was going to go with who. Um, You know, it, it was such a close kind of, and we're really two totally different players, yeah. you know, um, and and so it was really what Minnesota needed at the time, what they were looking for, and what Vancouver was looking for with their pick too. So you know, I, I spent some time in, in with the scouts in Minnesota. So we go to we go to Traverse City at their scouting meetings, and so it's like um that was a real experience because it was like eight or nine guys. You had the owners. Lou Nanny, the scouts, it was like a, almost a Senate hearing. And I'm over here on this table in one chair and getting questions fired at me. Like, why should we choose you? What can you do for our organization? What type of player you are? What's your assets, your strengths? You know, did you, did you know anything about that process before it happened to, to be able to prepare for anything? No, none at all. Which they do and now, they, right? Now they all know what's coming. Now, now, now they do. So, I go, I, I, I drive back to Detroit and, and my mom and dad asked, I was like, God, I just, was, just butchered that thing. So I, I fly back to PA. Um, cause now it's June. Now I have my, my now I'm getting ready for the prom. I'm getting my, <laughs> I'm getting my braces off in about a week. I'm like all excited about this stuff. I get a call from Vancouver can you come to Vancouver? We'd like to show you the town. So I get to the airport. Tony Tanti picks me up. Uh-huh. We go check in at the hotel. We go to dinner. We go to Richards on Richards that night. You know, you remember? Uh, oh yeah. And, and now, have you turned eighteen yet? Uh, Probably yes. Not. You you have been. Week after, so I just turned okay. seventeen. You know, June seventh, eighteen. So this was like June fourteenth, fifteen. The draft was June twentieth. So it was kind of boom boom. So I go out to Vancouver. <clears throat> and uh, it was just a whole different experience. I'm like, man, I, I love Vancouver. I love, you know, uh, um, God, what's the fella's name? Pat Quinn was the yeah. co- uh, GM coach. I mean, they just had a great staff, and, you know, we we just went around Vancouver and just had a great time. I'm like, God, you know, this could be – I like Vancouver too. So, But I had this thing in my – you know, inside that, you know, Minnesota, you knew what hockey was like there, being an American, being in Minnesota. So – <clears throat> there's still with this there was this ego thing that was hitting me too like i, I want to be the first pick i want to be the second yeah. american behind brian lawton to go to minnesota ironically the same team um and so lou nanny at the time didn't tell any of us what was the deal who was going where until he went up to the podium that day and made the selection and and so that was that so it was just so that was a nice birthday present for you wasn't it wasn't it a few yeah, days right after your 18th birthday it was a big buildup, so then flew home the next day and had my prom at school, at oh, high school, boy. and then uh, packed my bags, went to camp, and then I came back for my following year, didn't make things work out at camp with, with contract stuff, so I went back for another year, and I was on a, I was on a pace. My third year there just was just on an unreal pace. I, I think I was, God, I think I was at 110 points and, and 39 games or something crazy, and break my wrist in the all-star game i was like done for the year then i get called up to minnesota 
Yeah. Pierre Paget puts me in game four, game three in St. Louis with a cast on my hand to play my first game. And I was like, wow, this is just. Did you score? No, no. <laughs> I don't think I touched the puck. I was just like beer and headlights and I had a cast on my wrist. I'm like, what am I going to do? You know, Pierre, I'm like, coach, I'm like, this is just insane. So I think we got, we got knocked out in five or six. So, um, and then, you know, but the funny thing was Rick was there. We'll go back and to Rick. Rick was there my first year and was just was unbelievable guy. Just yeah. so lucky who was there my first year. He, he kind of makes sure everything was kind of, you know, there was a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of ribbing for rookies back then, a lot of hazing that went on in the juniors. And Rick, Rick was kind of, he, he kind of made things calm down a little bit because they were, they, they were ready to go hard on me. So, um, well, he, Wilson was that father figure, right? I mean, because yeah. I had yeah. Wilson like, I don't know what it'd be four or five years earlier in that in North Dakota before he, you know, before yeah. he went there. And, and I think he kind of stayed that way. The, the, the whole being drafted first of all, obviously there's pressure in that. Did it ever, mm-hmm. did it get to you at all? Like your first year pro. So, so now you get you into your first season in mini. Are, are you, mm-hmm. are you feeling any of that or expect, expectation wise? Or is it just kind of coming with the territory? I got this covered. Yeah, I, well, I, I think the, the 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 catch is you're going to the worst team in the league. So yeah. there's really not a lot that's going to probably change in a year or two. Um, but still, there's that inner pressure. Like you, you know, you have to come in there. You have to prove why they chose you, and you know the fans and you know the organization, and and then just guys that you're going to play with veteran guys who are, you know, 35, 36, Bobby Smith, you know, Broughton, Bellows, these guys, you have to, you know, earn their respect. So there was really a lot of, uh, yeah, there, I, I, I feel there was a lot of pressure at that point. And, you know, Pierre Paget was, he was a good, good, hard driven coach. And then my second year, Bob Ganey shows up. So Bob mm-hmm. comes in, Bobby Clark, Doug Jarvis, Rick comes back with him. Yep. So there was a whole this changing of the 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 scene, and then we go to the finals in '91, my second year against Pittsburgh. So, um, and then we thought, God, we're gonna, I'm gonna love going to the finals almost, you know, both every year, at least every other year. And it wasn't until we got to Dallas in '99 that we got back there. So it it was it was a uh, little took it we took it for granted a little bit. So did I. So you didn't realize how hard that the playoffs and getting to the finals was, but yeah, but that whole group nucleus of coaches and us, and then, you know, you guys started coming in and, you know, Bob started bringing in the players to kind of, you know, make this thing, uh, turn this thing around. So it was, it was a building process, but you well, know, you know was, we're, we're going to go amazing. down that path here, Mo, but I, you mentioned, you mentioned a couple of guys, you walk into that locker room and I'm wondering as a rookie, you know, you mentioned Smitty, I think Brian Bellows was there, uh, Mike Gartner, I believe, was there. You mm-hmm. played with Gartz. And there was another guy there by the name of Neil Broughton. And, and I'm just mm-hmm. wondering, you know, Bratzi had just, I mean, you know, he'd won the, the gold medal, you know, the whole 1980 thing. Uh, yeah. did, did, when you went to Mini, were any of those guys that would kind of grab you and, kind, you know, kind of be like the Rick Wilson as a coach and kind of bring you under their wing at all? And I'm, I'm, Or did you gravitate to anybody that your first experience there? Well, it was funny. It was more the the... the it was more the physical guys like Basil McRae was that though by yeah, but your style though, because I'm going to bring up guys like Baz and Churl yeah. and Billy Heward and guys like that. Yeah, Neil was really a soft spoken guy, a lot of fun. Um, you know, those guys just wanted to do well, put some stats up, and compete and play hard. I, I think it was more Baz Churls, you know, more the the grinding guys that really taught you how to be professional, like work yeah. hard and practice, show up early, stay after, do some extra, because these guys were doing it. And so, if, and they made sure to make me well aware that that's what you do, you know? So they were more like that. So, and, and Stu Gavin was my roommate at the time. So Stu was really tough, but you know, he was great guy. He was probably a perfect roommate for me at the time. Um, you know, then Reed Larson came in for a little bit. Reed was amazing. He was my roommate for a while. Rob Ramage, you know, guys that were just around for a long, time. You had some time. character they, guys. Some character guys grabbed you. Real quality guys yeah. that just made you, you know, open your eyes to, you know, being a professional and, you know, 
what it takes and the extra little effort and the work and you know the off season stuff so it was it was a, a big eye opener after my first year and then bob you know bob came in and the demand just kind of went up there i mean he just he grinded on me and he worked me to like no level before practice after just in me all day every day well let, well let, let, let's talk about bob because that's where i wanted to go mm -hmm. is you know you mentioned bob comes in i think he came in your second year right and mm -hmm. What did, and at the time, were you receptive to it? You know, and because we're talking about Bob Ganey that wants to, and he did the same thing with Bratzi. You know, Bratzi came to Dallas and he tried to, I think he had a conversation with Bratzi one day, um, kind of, hey, you know, as you get older, you're a 100 point guy, you're 80, 90 point guy, but if you want to hang around the league for a long time, you know, and continue to be good, you may have to learn how to play on the other side of the puck. Now you're coming where goals come come at lightning speed points come at lightning speed now you got a guy like bob ganey who we all know comes from montreal we had a certain way that we played in montreal bob ganey the the selkie trophy is basically named after bob ganey and mm -hmm. and i think what he was trying to do is just show you another element of who you could be and at the time how receptive were like jesus this isn't who i am like how how did that process go with him it was it was a ton of friction at the start. I really wasn't open to doing that. And he made it really clear if you weren't open to this, that you weren't going to play. And then a lot of the rumors started that they wanted to make a swap for Lyndon for me. Straight up chain, you know, let's get, you know, send Mike to Van, Trevor to Minnesota, make this switch. And so there was a lot of talk about that because Trevor, he went in right away and had, you know, great success and uh you know had a real good first couple of years to his career and so everybody's thinking god they made a mistake you know it's 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 you know they're you're spoon feeding this kid and he's the other ones off to the races and and being exactly what they thought they were getting in the draft so there was a lot of that going on at the time so and i was just and then and then a little bit more pressure came into thinking i you know i really have to you know perform and get to a level but Bob was like, you know, if you don't add these elements to your game, on top of what you do, we're we're not going to go really anywhere. We're not going to have success, and and you're not going to play. So, <laughs> so at that time, now now the learning curve started with me to try to figure out, okay, how do I combine both these parts of my game, and and still feel like I'm getting some return and trusting what I'm doing and. And so it, it, there, was, there was a long time there for, you know, so my next three years was really in, in Minnesota were tough, you know. So um, it wasn't until probably my last year in Minnesota, Ulf Dahlen came in and Ulf was was amazing to play with. So we had a really good year. Russ Cortnell came in, played a lot with Russ. So we, we had some speed and some success on the power play. And, and I had probably my best statistical year that year. Um, you know, so I, I think the, the ball was kind of rolling and the light bulbs were going off in my head that, you know, it's possible to kind of do this in both ends of the ice and still have some success and, and still live up to the hype or whatever. And then, you know, then that move to Dallas happened. And then I think at that point, it was just a whole nother, another huddle level. And, and then I had my first 50 year, only 50 year season goal season that following year, um, plus minus was finally on the plus side and then it was just kind of wow this you know now it's really kind of you know intriguing because you just saw you know now Eiserman just went through the same thing with Bowman and you had Sackett going through the same thing with Crawford these these top end guys adding a little bit of a, a component to their game that helps their team win and and so uh, you know it, it was just kind of um uh, a, a slow learning process, but I, I think once we got to that point, we we were kind of uh, it, it just became automatic at that point. So you mentioned the move to Dallas. Tell me your first thoughts. Like now you're 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 kind of all buckled in in Minnesota. I was there at the time we we made that mm -hmm. move, and um, you know, but I had only been there for a year and a half or whatever it may have been. Uh, your thoughts when when you hear I did Norm Norm Green talk about great owners, uh, and I know mm -hmm. you and Norm probably still to this day have a great re relationship, his wife, Kelly. But who who told you, did somebody come to you first and say, hey, here's what could be going down? Yeah, I think Norm, Norm we had a couple conversations there and, and 
but you know the rumor had the rumors had started well before that because you know if you remember they changed the logo on the uniform they got rid of the end so now norm came in and just put stars on there so everybody was kind of reading between the lines right. like how do you get rid of the n on the star on the jersey and without any you know story background something happening so that whole year rumors started we're going to go to anaheim seattle hamilton this and that and <clears throat> so i think it wasn't until dallas was kind of like the 11th hour i don't think really i don't think it was really on the radar um until I, I think norm checked it you know had a call from a few business people down there and roger Staubach and they went down to see facilities the mavericks were at reunion at the time it had the ability to make ice and so that decision was made overnight and then you know we had to get there for camp right so we're earlier in the summer i go down there for a couple events that we had that they wanted to kind of get the name out and so there's a couple <clears throat> i think things we did at target um i think there was a watching party at reunion or something for the finals uh with montreal and la or something and um you know so it was nobody there you know so you're sitting at these tables at target you know for a couple hours you know mike madonna who who's this guy no clue what we're i was like man what are we doing you know so and 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 they kind of tossed me out there as the you know the, the guy who's going to take the bullets off the start and just get out there and get you know some recognition or just kind of trying to throw some names out there to people but it was uh, it was tough sledding in the summertime. It was it was just hard until we got there, and then you know that first game when we played, we're like, you know, th- it was it was such a a party scene and the novelty yeah. for the first little while there. We could win ten, lose fifteen. You know, they didn't care. People were showing up. Unfortunately, Cowboys win three out of four Super Bowls our first years down there, so that was really kind of a tough uh, tough market at the time, but. You know, slowly but surely, I think we've we won over a fan base. There was a lot of Midwest people that were transplants from there, but there was this nucleus of fans that just gravitated the, to the game that are still there to this day. These fans, yeah. season ticket holders, that it was really something else. But then it just kind of gained speed, and boy, we we got into the playoffs that spring, um, and then that was the whole thing. That that just kind of changed. I think the whole complexion. I think we all figured, yeah, this is this is going to be fine. It's going to work out, and, and we got excited about it. Yeah, I remember Bob coming up to me. And you know how Bob speak is. So you know sometimes you're like, what the hell is he going? Where is he going here with this? He doesn't give you a lot of info. Sometimes he lets yeah. you hang yourself. You know what I mean? He asks you questions in a certain way. But I remember him talking to me. I think it was probably that next summer and. He was just talking about, I, I don't know about this team. I don't know about this group. And he goes, I got a lot of 500 guys here. And I had no clue what he meant by that. And I didn't, you don't say nothing. Like, that's how he, you hang yourself with him. And I kind of mm. just sat there and he kind of elaborated. And I'm like, finally, I just said, you know, there's only 23 of us here. What are you, 500, what, what, what's the 500 guy? And what he was referring to is there were guys that were playing that had come from Minnesota that were win one, lose one, win one, lose one. That was kind of their experience. And he meant they're 500 players. We, I don't want that here. And again, he's coming from, and we didn't either. You know I mean? Again, we were kind of programmed in a certain way coming out of, coming out of Montreal. And that's when the changes started to take place that you talked about. And Ooh. I just want you to kind of talk about, well, then, so Bob decides to, in my opinion, he doesn't step down. He steps up because if, if you if you hold the title of general manager and head coach, why the hell would you give up general manager and be the coach that the next GM can fire you? Right. So he's always thinking two yeah. steps ahead. He decides yeah. to he decides to move up to the bigger office, and in comes Ken Hitchcock. So let's first talk about Hitch. Your your first reaction mm-hmm. when when Hitch comes in because I think that. If Bob was the guy that was really hard on you in the sense of trying to get you to become that all-around player, did did Hitch follow that up, or did he try to massage that role? I think he massaged it at the start because yeah, I think he came into that year what end of January, early February, so he was only around for a few months of that last year, and I don't think we made the playoffs that year, right? If I remember right, so I I think he didn't want to kind of make too big of a splash. I think he just was surveying and observing what he had and what the deal was for the next three months and just kind of, and then go into the summer with uh, kind of a, a game plan of what he was going to do. 
players, movement changes, whatever that him and Bob were going to kind of do. But I think, uh, <clears throat> I think right away, probably a week after the season was over, whatever, he kind of planted the seed right away. He's like calling me and, you know, I met with him a few times and we'd have breakfast and coffee a few times a week. And, and, uh, you know, so it, it, he started kind of planting the seed about, okay, this is how we're going to do this. And this is what I need. And, you know, this is my thought with you. And, and, um, <clears throat> you know, Yuri, Yuri was there as well, letting in and, uh, you know, he was always kind of putting us two together and, and kind of naming that we're going to, this is how we're going to play. This is, what we're going to be expecting of you. And this is the type of role I'm going to put you in. And this, he's telling me this in late April, early May to kind of get the subconscious ready. You know, he, yeah. he, he wasn't going to tell me at training camp. Cause that's just, you know, I felt he just, he knew that was too late. So he started, he started digging into me early. What, in the what summer role and, did he tell you at the time? You know, at, at that point, he's like, you know, we're going to start playing you guys against other teams, top lines. And Which so, you had never that, done that before, right? Because you always had no, the we Stewie just, Gavins and guys like that that would do that. We were we were against the third and fourth lines because we felt we could, you know, I Take think Bob or whoever thought we could create some offense against those guys. It's certainly at home where we get the last change, we could go out there and, and try to get that last, the third or fourth D pairing or whatever. Um, but Bob, I mean, Ken was totally opposite. You, you know, we're putting you out there against – Fetterbergs and Iserman's, yeah. Iserman's and, you know, you name it, Lindros line when they were in Philly. And, and I was like, man, this is, you know, so I'm like, are we ever going to get a, a sniff offensively? Because, you know, that's a lot of energy you're wasting just to neutralize these guys. And this bothers you, doesn't it? I mean, it, 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 I mean, a guy that's been putting up points forever. Had you bought into being the team guy at that point? Like, man, this, yep, we're going to win a cup this way. No, no, no. It was it was so premature at the time. I'm like, man. I was like, that's our that's what we're gonna go into next year. And I'm thinking, I'm like, so against the idea. And after we talking, I'm like, God, this is not not gonna be fun. It's not gonna be enjoyable. We're just gonna be really, you know, not being the team what we thought. So I, I was totally against it. And um, you know, so we go into camp, and you know, we we have some exhibitions and there's a little bit of a taste of it and still it's still at that point it's you know the the year 97 98 i think it was was his first year i want to say um maybe but uh and, and we went to the conference finals i went think to the conference Detroit. finals that year yes so there was a little bit of uh, of return on not knowing what you were getting yourself into there. So there's like flashes of stuff coming, you know, uh, of, of some results coming that frankly, I never thought would come because mm -hmm. you're, you're able to keep up with the, the guys that were offensive and they weren't quite dependable or quite responsible yet on the defensive end. And you can kind of really, if you were good defensively, his, his point and Bob's, you know, and it, it had Jarvis and Rick and, you know, you had all these defensive minded guys just surrounding you. So it's like, you know, if you do these things, you're going to realize you have the puck a lot more. And so that really didn't sink in until, sure. you know, you started doing it. And you're like, man, you get the puck back. They are they're The offensive guys you're playing against really weren't working that hard to get it back. They just waited for a mistake and a turnover and they would go. So. Um, those, those kind of things were like little lights going off that, you know, man, we're, we're getting the pucks and we're getting more chances than I would if I was just kind of relying on our defense to make great passes or my linemen to get point, uh, puck into me. So we're like, wow, this is just really kind of interesting. So it, it, it really kind of came from that. So that, that, that year was really, was a year that you, you got a lot of, I guess self worth that you were really kind of contributing in a in a in a way that wasn't offensive. You know, you didn't. You know, you're. And then he had me penalty killing. He's like, you know, now that was a whole thing I hadn't been experienced to. It was about the, the big picture, right? Like what was going to happen yeah. come game eighty three. You know, right. that's when it. That's what it was all aimed towards. What was what was interesting about penalty killing is that you you learn to stop and start 
face the puck, getting passing lanes, shooting lanes in your own zone, which is primarily what you do when you don't have the puck in your own zone. So there's, there was like, for, there was this process that, that, that I think Hitch and Bob knew, you know, that they get you to buy in. Mike's not going to get it, but we're, we're slowly integrating this yeah. whole thing. So yeah. penalty killing was a real kind of game changer in how I played down low, um, defensively without the puck. Don't, so that, you, that, don't you think also from, from your standpoint as being an offensive, you know, minded juggernaut kind of a player that when you are on the killing penalties, your instincts help you because you know where you mm -hmm. would try to make that pass through that seam. And if you've got an Iserman or a Gretz or Messier, whoever it may be, you kind of see what they see and you can kind of bait them a bit and try to pick some of those passes off. So there's another added bonus there, I believe. And the other thing is, I think of the defensemen or whoever the guys that are playing against guys like you, you they got to be on their toes a little bit instead of just thinking all oh, these guys are going to just get the puck and throw it down. And that's not the way it works. You guys are going to go down and try to score. Yeah, yeah. There was there was an always a little bit moments where you could poach a little bit and just kind of maybe exaggerate or in, or, or initiate or just kind of ex experience. Maybe you knew where those pucks were going on the power play. Um, and so you could really, you know, they telegraph stuff and you can kind of read and, you know, how the D's work on the blue line. And you always had a guy off the half boards that was kind of the trigger guy. And, um, you know, and you could anticipate certain things that were going to happen. And then back then too, you always had a forward on D. So if yeah. you did get a turnover and that defense was on D, that offense, that forward was on D, Boy, you went right to him because yes. he couldn't, you know, he's backing up. He's trying to play D and you, you just could kind of go right to him and really kind of almost create an offensive chance from that. So that that in turn um, was kind of a, a fun thing to do. And then, you know, then then it was kind of evolving into face offs. Now I'm out there at the end of periods and games taking draws when we're up a goal. So now there was really some some meaningful uh, uh reassurance at the end of the game when you're out there now you're out there protecting leads now there now it's a whole nother level of of this responsibility satisfaction, satisfaction responsibility at the end of the game that you're 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 thrust into so i almost i almost had more i almost felt better about my game in that predicament rather than being six five up and we have to create a goal and to try to tie the game yeah. i i got more fulfillment out of protecting the lead and trying to yeah, you, know, you have a bigger bite out of the game when it's all said and done with, you know, instead of yeah. now you're out there, not are you only out there when you're down a goal with 30 seconds to go. Now you're out there taking that face off because of your responsibilities when you're up a goal. And, and because yeah. I was going to ask you earlier, like as an offensive guy, and guys are all, you got to be worried about points and that's how you get your money and your contracts. Is there mm -hmm. ever a time going, Jesus, if I'm going to play this way, how am I going to get paid? You know what I mean? <laughs> but now you actually become doubly valuable when you can play in mm -hmm. all parts of the game. That that probably took yeah. you time to figure it out. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I, I, and and Bob was a tough negotiator, so I, I had a stretch there where, you know, those guys really kind of controlled, you know, your destiny, you yeah. know, your livelihood, your future. It's it's kind of flip flop now. Players kind of control everything, and management and coaches are just along for the ride. And back then, those guys had the hammer, you know, so. I went there. Uh, I had a stretch, almost like two or three years, where I just was was signing one year deals, and Bob's like, you know, hey, you had a good, you know, do it again, you know. So I'm like, you know, and I had a then one particular year, I I, I think it was Hatch and I, we had contract problems. We didn't show up to camp. We're skating together in Plano, yeah. And Bob's like, go, oh, come on in. We'll give you a one year deal. You know, do it again. So I had these two years in a row where I did these one year deals. And, and he's uh, a hard guy to say no to, isn't he? That's the problem. Oh, I mean, and and being a holdout back then, boy, you you were like ridiculed. Yeah, you're like you know, they made you just you know not feel like you were anything involved in the team, and you're just out for your own personal vendetta, and you know it's very selfish of you, and and um, you know so um, you know so we <laughs> so he was tough. Then finally, he said, like, "Okay, we're gonna do." Seven year deal after about two or three one year deals. So he's like, okay, you know, but, um, but then back to the, you know, just being more of a consistent guy because I was, you know, around the mid 30 goals and, 
a point of game. You know, it wasn't Eisenman and Mario numbers and all those guys. And um, but um, you know, you, you you felt your self worth was more rounded than being yeah. actually one dimensional. So um, then Bob Gainey kind of kicks in or has been kicking in as the general manager kind of comes along, sees what we did in 97 or whatever it may be. And then the moves kind of come in. And I'm sure some of you guys are going, Oh sure. Here's another guy from Montreal. Here's another guy from Montreal, you know, Scrudlin, Keen, Carbono. But then looking back, you can see exactly what the plan was. And then mm -hmm. the day that the big move happened and, and Brett Hull comes to town, did was there? Did you have to get involved in that at all? Did anybody ever ask you to call Holly, or was that out of the blue? Did Holly ever talk to you prior to him signing? Yeah, uh, I, Holly and I had a conversation that summer because he, I, I think he was talking, and, and I think Gee was here at the time too. Yep, so he was. I think uh, Holly had talked to Gee because Gee was just in St. Louis, and um, you know, I, I, well, the one that got the ball rolling was the Kevin Hatcher for Zubob deal. I think that kind of really kind of got everything moving and. And I was like, how's this guy not able to play with Mario Lemieux? And we're able to get him for, you know, that. And yeah. Bob made the deal. And, you know, so that was the deal. And then Sidor came over um, for Doug Smolik and Shane mm -hmm. Churla, I think. Yeah. So I was like, wow, you know, we're, we're not giving up much and we're getting some <laughs> killer return at the time. And then, and then Belfour. And then it, it, the Hully deal was really kind of a game changer. I think it was just, you know, at, perfect timing. He wanted to win. He knew we had a really good team and he just, you know, he, at that point he would, he would have went anywhere just to have a chance to win a cup. And, sure. and, uh, you know, it was lucky it was us, but yeah, you, then you have to have the sandpaper guys, like you said, screwy Keener, uh, Dave Reed, Pat Verbeek, um, you know, guy just go down the line that we had. Yeah. Just guys that just complimented our game was kind of tough skill and just kind of it, it kind of came together really well for us and so it was just you know a phenomenal run but yeah the, the the free agency thing the free spending tom was making great changes and and hicks and bob and and the whole the whole the whole group just were puzzling this thing together like you, you, i've never seen so mo then we we win the cup and for you that's your is that the top of the mountain i mean is there an exhale there, I mean, not knowing that you know what's down the road for you, but mm -hmm. does it all kind of go finally? You know what I mean? Like, is it that kind of feeling for you, personally? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was instant. It was just an instant. I, I was like, I, I just was just a total relief just thinking about everything from that draft up to that point in a nanosecond as we're on the ice. It's like, man, it's just like, wow. It's just like, I, I, I am. Whatever happens after this moment i am totally perfectly fine with because you know you have that you know that fulfillment and the feeling of uh, of being out there with all of us and you know that that winning feeling was just it, it's remarkable. fine it's fine until training camp starts the next year because you get that taste yeah. of blood right then you're like now you want it again so uh, the question i'm sure everybody that will listen to this and wants to know your opinion of it give us the interpretation of the rule on um, the goal that everybody, I can walk through an airport at times in Buffalo and I can't believe people can still recognize me and somebody, you'll see them looking at you, right? And then they just go past you. Then you can hear them about 30 feet past you going, mm -hmm. it wasn't a goal. So <laughs> give us your interpretation of that goal. Um, you know, there, there was, it was such a gray area. It's still a gray area today. You know, it's, you know, they call it, they don't, they change the rule. What's, Interference on the pads, you know, was it was the obstruction was it obstructing Hashik and the ability to make a save, you know, how that whole thing transpired. It was just, I think it was just so rapid. I, I I don't really know what they thought or what they should have called there. It was just kind of a a weird dynamic. But you know, I tell Holly all, all the time as he was as as that play was happening and and Yuri finally got it on net. I was I was kind of tracking Brett right behind him. And so when he backed in, you know, he kind of tipped it. Hoshik goes down on his, on his, on his stomach. He's laying there, and then, and then the turn happens. So then, Brett turns to kind of trying to find out where the puck was, and it was just kind of it was it was riding his skate as he was turning, 
And as he's turning, I'm sweeping in behind him. So I see this puck coming, coming back between his legs, but then it's, it's stuck to his stick. So I'm, I'm kind of waiting for this thing just to kind of just spit out, just come out maybe a foot. <laughs> I scoop it up and I have the whole net. I can just push it or skate it in myself. He turns and it's stuck to his stick and I try to dig it out and his leg, leg knocks my stick away and I'm still jamming at it. And then he looks down and realizes it's in his right leg and he kip, kicks it up to his stick and scores. You know, so at, at that point, his left leg is in the blue, in the crease. You know, so I, at one particular second, it, both feet were out. But as he turns, his left leg, leg goes back into the crease. So, I, you know, it's it's really hard to say because at that point, any feet in the crease. But see, you know, what, weren't you? Let's let's first get this out there. The puck has been sticking to Holly's stick and skates for over 700 times in his career. Right. That, <laughs> that's just what happens to that guy. But I thought yeah. the interpretation was always you can't go in, into the crease until the puck goes into the crease. Or mm -hmm. was it you can never go into the crease, but the puck was already in the crease. So then right. you can go ahead and go in there. That's what yeah. that's what I, that's my defense in the whole thing. So as yeah. far as I know, what I just tell them, anybody that gives me shit about it, I'm like, well, I don't know. I got a ring sitting on my table at home. So apparently it was mm -hmm. a good goal. You know, but what yeah. kind of tells you something about it, though, is the following year, I think they changed the rule. Mm -hmm. Right. It's almost like, hey, we made a mistake or something. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then that just angered more Buffalo fans. If yeah. you change the rule after a year that you, you right. know, it happened the way now you change the rule. You guys, you know, you effed it up. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, the original shot hit Hashik because he, he's, he's down sprawled out. So, you know, I, I think once it hits him, it's free game. You got to get in there and exactly. somehow, yeah, you know, get a rebound or something. You just can't wait for it to kind of clear. Like, okay, now I'm, I'm it's back outside the crease. Now I can I can go in it. But you know, I was I'm like I'm like I'm like this far away, you know, from from dragging that damn thing out of the skate. Are, are you? Are, do you ever have those thoughts where you're like, if I just wish it wouldn't have stuck to his skate, I wanted to score no. that goal. I, no. I'll be, that's a yes. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I, I whacked at it one good time and he just turned as I was getting my stick in between his legs. And you'll, if you ever watch it again, you just kind of see that, that moment where I'm kind of, kind of sliding by and I kind of hit it, but his leg had already turned. And I'm like, you know, if it just would have squirted out, there was nobody around me. I had that whole side, the whole corner, everybody was over there with, you know, Yuri and myself and Brett and the, the whole scrum. But, you know, I, I think that might have been Holly's second or third shift in, yeah. in three overtimes. He couldn't stand up, yeah. you know, so I, <laughs> thankfully. Well, you were playing work. with a, weren't you playing with a broken wrist in that series too? Yeah. So yeah. I was, I had the, the cast and the wrist and the whole thing, but I, I feel if we went game seven, I, I think we would, we would have had a, we would have been in big trouble. We would have, I think. With that goal. I, I yeah. Three or four guys that couldn't have played. Yeah, I think we would have been. Things happen been, for a reason, Mo. It's a good thing you're on our yeah. team because you're the you're the chosen one. Hey, so let me <laughs> let me ask you about a couple uncomfortable times now with the Dallas Stars mm -hmm. and uh, the C. Wearing mm -hmm. that letter, and then having that letter removed at a certain point. I, I'm just curious. Like I, I can't imagine if there was a conversation with you, or or how that went down, and and how did that hit you? Um, I think at the moment it was, it was, a you know, just a quick knife to the chest. Like, you know, you, you know, then you feel like, man, did I, did I not live up to what that having that C on your chest means to the team, the organization, you know, was I letting that many people down that it needed to get removed at that particular moment? Cause I think, you know, Hatch had moved on. There was this like this transitional mm -hmm. period. I think I was just kind of the uh, logical choice at that moment when Darian left. And then it was kind of at the moment. And after it was gone, I was like, I, I felt like I was just a filler. You know, I was just a temporary fill. You know, there was going to be something that happens uh, coming soon. Um, you know, so then we struggled. And then, you know, the thing to do is to shake things up. You know, it's, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's the kind of, did you get something. any kind of explanation, any reasoning for it? Anything that made sense to you? Um, you know, I, I, 
you know, I, I think it was fun just to say, you know, hey, this ain't, you know, you've always been an important part. You're always going to be, you know, a voice of this yeah. team, you know, the responsibility and this and that. So they, they massage it in a way that makes it feel like, you know, there's a bigger fist to fry that we're working at that, you know, you don't have to worry about this thing, you know, and, you know, so they, they tried to, you know, massage uh, it, spin doctor a little bit yeah. and uh, make it into a positive. So, um, but then the flip side was, you know, there was really no coming out press conference for Brendan. Right. You know, so it, it was like he took it over in the middle of the night and we we're supposed to wake up the next day and, not and then notice. you got to answer all the questions, right? And then I, you know, then I took the, you know, yeah, the brunt of the, the conversations and the interviews in every city that we go to that particular year. So, um, but, uh, you know, Brendan didn't get his rightful introduction to that because that could have been a nice little, you know, press conference for him. So they, they kind of botched that up on both sides. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, the other thing is, as the end of the Dallas Stars, so to speak, you guys don't, well, I don't even know if it was agreeing on a contract. Wasn't it just, uh, well, I think the way it came out in the press is they weren't going to, was Army the GM at the time? I I'm, knew he was. Knew he was. Well, well yeah. okay. I forgot that part. So that must yeah. make that part even a little bit more uncomfortable for you. A guy that you guys are friends and, you know, teammates, and then all of a sudden not going to offer you a contract. Yeah, I, I think that's one thing that just still sticks in my crow to this day, how that whole thing un unfolded. The last game of the year prior to how it was worked into the, like this some type of going away celebration game for, you know, and Turco was involved in that and Yuri. So it was, it was kind of like this, you know, last game kind of deal. Yeah. You know, we tie Anaheim late. We go into a shootout. Yuri and I score in the shootout. It's like this whole like storybook ending. Sure. And then, and then you know, I, I think at the time the team was in receivership, so we were getting checks from banks in the in New York at the time that previous year. So no one really owned the team. So um, you know, Joe stepped in. I think Crawford was a coach there for a little bit, and then someone else. There was a, two or three coaches there in a in a matter of two or three years. And so there was really no, um, you know, uh, you know, structured ownership and, you know, everything was kind of up in arms there. And, and so, you know, Joe and I had coffee and he, he kind of said that he wasn't going to extend a, a contract to me. And I was like, you know, so to this day, I was like, you know, I always felt there's certain, you know, not to pump my tire. I think, there's certain players. I'm, I know where you're going, and I'm not going to disagree with what you're about to say. That almost feel like they should probably write their own ending to this deal. Yep. And if 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 I felt like I wanted to do one more year in Dallas, that could have been easily done. Yeah. You know, yep. I I just feel like you you deserve that, and you deserve that. Yeah, I should have just been able, like, okay, Mike, we'll we'll, we'll give you this for let's let's do one more year. This is you know. And I would have been, you know, great, thank you, and then that was it. So there's always been this like bitter taste. I I think just how that whole thing evolved, and it just, you know, to this day, it just eats at me. So, do you decide to go to Detroit for your last mm -hmm. one? Is that kind of a let's go to a rival team, or is it kind of just let's go home? Uh, you know, did you know that, that you were going to only play another year after that at that point, or did you plan on playing three more, four years? Where were you at in your head then when you left Dallas? I think mentally I wasn't really quite felt done yet. I think, uh, yeah, because I, I, as the summer went on, I think it was probably two weeks before uh, free agency opened Kenny Holland calls, and, and, and we had just booked a, a golf trip to Scotland with, Brad Richards, you know, Vinny LeCavier, Marty St. Louis, Brendan Morrow. There's like 12 of us that went over to Scotland that we're leaving in four or five days. And Kenny just calls me before I head over there. I hadn't, at that point, I knew, I figured I was done. Um, I wasn't going to play again. And, uh, you know, so at that point up to July, I really haven't worked out or done anything. And uh, the only other little tidbit that was out there was the Minnesota Wild. 
So right. it was Minnesota Wild and and Detroit. And uh, I think Chuck Fletcher was still was at Minnesota at the time. So there was a little bit of interest there too, which would have been really great. But I, I, I think with the Wings, it was like the chance to go home to Detroit, you know, play with that soup, Zetterberg, Lidstrom, you know, an amazing team, amazing, amazing organizations. Go play one more time at home. And thinking there's a Stanley um, Cup there. Yeah. Uh, maybe there's going to be one more good little run in there with all these guys that are still there. They still had, you know, everybody was still there. Cronwall, Franzen, Holmstrom, you know, everybody was, all the, the main characters were still in place uh, from the previous runs they've had. So, um, you know, I said, man, this is, you know, and it seems like everybody that, Every old guy that goes to Detroit, there's some type of thing that happens and they end up winning. Hully did it, Robitaille, all these guys go to Detroit and they end up having some type of fountain of use that happened. They have some fun, they enjoy it. And uh and I and I did and 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 I realized, you know, how fast these guys play when I got to camp, how much I felt like I was in out of shape. Um, but how hard they work off the ice. Like I've never seen a group of guys train and work out off ice before practice after far more than I think I thought I did. I thought I did a lot, but it was nowhere close to what these guys did. And, uh, and that kind of was, you know, a good explanation of why these guys. Well, hang on. Some of us here worked hard off the ice. <laughs> it was a different we had had a workout. Very good hard off ice work. <laughs> I have, and, um, uh, there, there's a couple numbers for me, Mo, that stick out. Obviously, one is 561, and we know what that's for. Um, not so many, not much about your goals. It's it's your beer, and so <laughs> I, I would I would like to get my hands on that. I don't know if you're making that stuff anymore, but the other number, more importantly, is 14.99. Take us to the reason <laughs> this did not hit 1500. Well, there was a few issues before. I would love to have really... Chelios on this thing right now, too, because oh. this would be a good conversation with you, too. Same with Commodore. He would love. Yes. To Com- oh, Commie. Commie would be good. Yeah. Answer this question for me. Um, but in hindsight, you're looking at, you know, there was a full year loss with a lockout. There was another half year lockout. So that's, you know, you look at it. I try to tell myself there, there's those are hundred. That's 120 games right there that uh-huh. you know lost to labor issues, um, you know. But leading up to this deal, I I had the injury just around Thanksgiving, um, so I had surgery. I was out for a while. So then, as my return was coming in, coming, I'm looking at the calendar. I'm looking at the schedule. I'm looking at games left. I'm looking at my games played and th- this 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 matchup is happening like, okay, if I get back the beginning of March, I think it was eighth or ninth. I got probably four weeks of hockey left. I think there was 14 games left. I was at, you know, so let's do the math. 14, 80, five. Would that be right? 95, 14. I was told there'd be no math on this show. I know. I'm like, so somewhere in that 1485, 1484. So I'm thinking, okay, there's 14, 15 games left. I got 14, 15 games to get to 1500. I said, if if anything can happen after missing, you know, eight, 10 weeks for the injury in Detroit in the middle of the winter was to have a little silver lining at the yes, last, you know, the game before the last game of the year, I, I would have hit 15. Mm-hmm. And then it would have been 15.01 in yep. Chicago. So um, get back in the lineup, clip it along, get to 14.97. Everybody knows what's going on. The sure. media, the players, you know, oh, we're all talking about, you know, they're t- oh, man, Minnesota, against Minnesota, at home, 1,500. How cool is that? You know, wake up from my nap on the, the game, the day of the wild game and, and Babcock calls to tell me he was going to leave me out of the game. So I was like, I, I was dumb. I mean, did you think he was serious? I was at, at first, I, not, not at first. I thought, you know, he was going to say, Hey, you're, 
God, you're coming up to that number. We're excited yeah. for you just to give you, you know, you got two more hanging, you know, give you one of those deals. And and it didn't come after he was like, I'm going to have you out tonight for, you know, to this game tonight. And I was like, and I, I, I was just kind of caught off guard. I didn't know what to say. So, he hang, he, you know, we hang up and I'm like, so I get ready. I go to the game. I'm around and. You know, there's the lineup on the board. And I was like, and everybody's looking at the board and the lineup in the locker room, the assistant coaches. McCrimmon was there, McLean, all those guys. And, you know, at the time, those guys were scared to death. Everybody was scared to death to say something to, to Babcock. And no one said anything. And I was like, yeah, like, can't believe it. So I'm going to go to Chicago and play the next game. And, and get fourteen ninety nine. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. And so his reason is, Mike, we didn't bring you in here to play fifteen hundred games. We brought you in here to win a Stanley Cup. <laughs> How does that oh. sit with you? <laughs> so that right there just deflated my existence of playing. I did not want to. That did it. I was. I was like, I'm playing. The, what happens? Whatever happens the rest of the way, I'm done. I'm, I'm not playing anymore. So um, Babcock's after this year, I played two games in the playoffs and, uh, you know, that was it. So I was like, uh, I, I can't, well, it seems like he's got a, cause I felt I really loved playing there. I love the guys. I love the way they played, you know, and, and, and I thought after I got back, I felt, man, I'm, I'm in by Thanksgiving. I think I was in the best shape probably in the last five years of my career, even in Dallas. Mm-hmm. Like I was just, Draper, Cleary, there was like four or five of us, and and you won't believe this, I can tell you, we would get up early at 7, 7.30. We would meet at a gym in Birmingham. We'd all train together for an hour with this guy. He was just this trainer off the charts guy. And then go down and drive down to the Joe and practice. We did this three or four days a week. And it was just, you know, it was unbelievable how hard these guys work. And we did this all the time. And I was like, I'm like, Thanksgiving, I felt like I, I at that point, I'm like, I'm going to play another two or three years just to, for sure. Yeah. And then the fluke deal happens. And then at the end, I was just like, wow, that just. You took whatever took was left away. in it. You took it away was, from you. Was, yeah. Was, as soon as that last game was over, as soon as game seven was over in San Jose, we flew home. And I was packed, and I was—I think I was in Dallas the next day that night. So I, I was just—I I, I knew that was over. Yeah, I, I think some of these guys just do it to prove that that they're the guy in charge. I, I don't understand it. Uh, mm-hmm. I want to—I just want a couple more things, Mo, and I'm going to let you go. Um, I appreciate you hanging around this long. Um, how important was that? I mean, you knew it was coming, but how important is it for for a guy like you that you're a first ballot dude going into the Hall of Fame? I mean, I, I don't think there was any question about it. And, I, and I'll ask you the same thing. Uh, the Stanley Cup, you got the Stanley Cup. You're in the, the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame. You're in the National Hockey League Hall of Fame. Where, where do those things ra- rank to the Stanley Cup? You know, it, NHL Hall of Fame versus a Stanley Cup. First off, the importance of you basically being a, acknowledged. Did you have Babcock? Did you call him to introduct you <laughs> into that conversation when you go up there to get that jacket? So just what, what, uh, what did that all mean? Um, well, I, I think that was the pinnacle. I think that's, I, I thought the cup was, but I thought that phone call, I knew, you know, you know, you got your three year kind of little grace period until you got, you know, you're, you're, uh, qualified to get accepted into it. And, and so I knew that was kind of come coming soon. It was early July. Uh, of my third year of announcing that I retired. So I, I, I knew this was coming. If it was going to come, it was going to come fairly uh, soon. Um, and so I, I, part of me was like hope, you know, obviously you're really thinking that that's coming or hoping and, and you just don't know until that 416 area code came on my yeah. cell and I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh, I'm like afraid to answer Like, you know, are they going to tell me like, God, we, we're just, it just can't, you know, it's not going to happen this year. Do they even call you to tell you that you don't get in? I, don't I was going to ask do. you that question too. Is a 416 yeah, come up and tell you no? Phone call. 
you would be, you know, I, you know, they just don't call you because so I, I'm, I figured that one out. But um, but when it was when it was um, oh, Lenny McDonald and uh, and God, who was JD, J- John Davidson, this sounds like I'm just calling you to, you know, congratulate you on, on getting voted in. And I was like, yeah, I just. Just, I think I cried more then than I did at the cup and the yeah. whole summer there after we won and everything else. I was just, boy, that was just like, that, I, that, that was just kind of one of those things you don't play the game to get into the Hall of Fame. Those, it, it just kind of evolves into that and it just, it happens like, you know, when I was drafted, I'm, I'm, my goal is to make the Hall of Fame at the end of my career. It's like that one of those things, but when it, it hits you like that, it's like, man, you, you got recognized for, you know your career right and, and you, you you hope you put into it everything you got out of it you know no regrets you know you didn't feel like you you know kind of half-assed it you kind of worked hard you, you know you, you didn't take anything for granted and all these things kind of playing them in your mind that you know um could I have done more could i just dug in a little deeper and this and that so the those questions were you know taken away with that phone call and it was just one of those like man that's a, this is kind of this is the ultimate so um you know between the cup and that and then you know the jersey retirement you know that's right up there too and, and that recognition and so um yeah the, the hall of fame was really really a tough one it, it to surprises there. me when when i hear guys like yourself and shelly and guys talk about that because i asked shelly the same question and it's like i'm like we all knew it. I mean, we all know it's a no brainer. Holly, all you guys, it's a no brainer. Why are you guys sitting on pins and needles all the time? But you know, it's funny. I asked Shelly that and you wouldn't, his answer to it. I said, Shelly, what's more important to you or how do you rank the, the cups versus, uh, you know, the hall of fame. And he goes, you know what I want the most is I want my Jersey retired. I want my Jersey to hang in that building in Chicago. So when my kids mm-hmm. walk in, you know, at that point and they can see that and I, and I totally get that. So, uh, yeah. I mean, again, you, you deserve everything you got, Mo. I mean, it's just ridiculous that some of you guys think you're not getting there. It pisses most of us off when, <laughs> when you talk like that. <laughs> Listen, I want to, let, let's just finish on what you're, what you're doing now. You're, you're back with Minnesota, Minnesota wild. Yeah. What is, yeah. you've been doing that now for three, four years or whatever it may be. Yeah. And so what, what, uh, what do you, what are you doing? What do they get you doing there? Um, there's, there's a little, just more involvement with the, the current roster and working with Dino. Dino was a great guy, you know, playing with him in Dallas and Billy Guerin was there. So there's like, there's this like little familiarity with those guys. So it was a lot of fun. Um, Darby Hendricks is there. Frederick Shabbat's a goaltending coach. I played with him in Prince Albert for a hot second. Um, so there's a lot of familiar, uh, you know, familiar guys that are back there. Um, and, and the owner, Craig was, it, Leopold is just a, a great guy. We, I met him through a mutual friend actually who I played golf with out here in Phoenix. He was good friends with, uh, Craig. And so that introduction happened and, and we just, um, really hit it off. And so we we're trying to find some type of position for me. And this was prior to them hiring Billy Guerin as a GM. So, um, you know, I went to the, uh, board of governors meeting with him and sat through that. Um, which is really phenomenal to to see how smart Gary Bettman is and how much he runs this league. And uh, so that was really interesting uh, to see that. But uh, Craig's like, I, I think I'm going to let go our GM. Would you would you help me find one? So he goes public with that in the media. And so I I I, I didn't realize I didn't I had so many friends after that thing was in the paper. I'm like I got calls from people I'd never heard heard from that they're calling for their brother or teammate or whatever so we went through a handful of interviews and and uh and baz was mccray was one of them so he was he was a he was a he was a riot so we 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 centered on billy garen so and i was still kind of working a little bit on the the business side with craig and and a little bit help with 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 billy because he was kind of going through the coach issue issue with uh bruce boudreau at the time so that was going to be evolving and changing so when Dino got the job, it was it was kind of more let's move to more hockey and, and just be more involved with the current roster and you know just helping guys out. You know, young guys go through a lot changes and pressure and situations. I you know I, I just feel like you know and Billy was the same. There, was, there wasn't a lot of situations that we hadn't seen when we were younger and and uh, you know that we could you know give light to and just kind of be that extra sounding board, extra set of eyes and ears for everything. So. I've enjoyed it uh, being more 
team related and being in the coach's room and around the players and just kind of here. And, you know, and I speak to a lot of them on the phone and just kind of giving that little talk to them to think it, you know, it's not as bad as you think out there, you know, because they're always, you know, like, I don't know what I'm doing out there. I'm exhausted. I'm overthinking. I, you know, I'm not, you know, getting anything out of the games. It's like, those are, you know, those are things I told, told myself for yeah, years. And yeah. it's like, you know, you, and, and, and Bob was a magician at trying to narrow your focus down and just, you know, commit to what you can commit to and, you know, control your thing and your, your own self. And, and that's some of those things that Bob would tell me years ago. I just, you know, they're cemented in my brain and my subconscious. I, so it's I'll like, tell you, it, it's so true. I mean, you know, I would just try to relay to those guys the same thing and, you know, it, it's so, hard, isn't it? It's hard to get them yeah. out of your head. I mean, I, 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 oh. I say that all the time. I said, when I'm yelling at some of our players with our U18 team, we travel around the country with like, oh shit, that's something Hitch would have said. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and it's all that stuff that comes back. But the reason that they said it is because it works. You know what I mean? Yeah. They, they don't have yeah. championships and because it doesn't work. So, um, yeah. exactly. uh, let me, give me some up, uh, Kaprizov. I mean, you get to see him play. Like, what are your thoughts? I mean, it, it, you know, it's amazing your team, the wild with him out of the lineup are scoring more goals actually when he was in the lineup. That's a good thing. But I mean, uh, where, where do you rank this kid? Well, isn't that the fact when your top guys out of the yeah. lineup, no one can look to him to score anymore. Everybody's got to look to themselves to say, Oh, you I got to start contributing. But when he gets in the lineup, all oh, Kirill's back, he'll yeah. handle it. He'll yeah. take, you know, he'll do the scoring. And, and it's kind of funny how that, how uh, it's like even Malkin, he plays his best hockey when Crosby's not in the lineup. You know, it's like one of those things. And but the kid is just, uh, you know, really relentless. He's he's I guess he's a hardworking guy. I mean, he's he uh, he's got no quit in his game. I mean, he's second, third effort guy. You know, if you steal it from him, he's going to come back and steal it back from you. But he has this his skating that this this whole ten to two thing. Alfie is the lost art. Yep. I'm like, I try to do that. I think my hips kind of can pop out of socket. It's like, and every kid at eight, nine, 10 years old is being taught how to keep their speed and keep the, you know, their edge work and this whole thing. And, you know, now they come out of corners and tur they're turning with more speed than when they came into the turn. So it's, it's and this kid can go, he can go like this all the way down the boards mm -hmm. in the park. And, and guys are darting at him and he just, He's very elusive. He's got a great shot, but you know him and Zuccarello have a like little, really kind of like this little language that they got. They and and Zuko's he's a real treat to watch. He can he can thread some pucks and he kind of can see some ice. But um, Kirill's been you know really you know breath of fresh air. They really haven't had a a go to skill guy in that organization probably you know maybe since Gabrick. There's only been two guys just. Kaprizov and Gabrick, and I think Kaprizov is probably will be their most talented guy that that organization has probably ever seen. Well, you've got a hell of a team, and they're playing right at the right time of the year. It'd be interesting if, if Dallas and, and Minnesota happen to meet in the playoffs. I'm mm -hmm. sure you'll be sitting in a different suite if they come to town. You won't be sitting in, in that one up there where we're used to seeing you, Mo. Mo, I want to thank you so much for coming on today, and I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Yeah. You know, apparently your buddy Dirk uh, Nowitzki is going into the Hall of Fame, it sounds like, here soon. And I think he's got a street named after him downtown here. I'm trying to figure out why there isn't a Madonna Lane or an alley or something down here. We need to get your name up here, Mo. But it could be a back alley they could use somewhere. Yeah, I, I know a couple. I know a couple alleys we could put, her, put your name up. I could be the cross street on there. Uh, again, Mo, thank you very much. I, I, again, drafted first overall, the Stanley Cups, the Hall of Fames. Um, I think most importantly, you're, you're a husband. You're a father to five. Um, you're a hell of a teammate, and, and I appreciate you coming on. So that'll, that'll do it for today with the uh, icon Mike Madano here on Sud with Luds. Thanks, Mo. Well, Luds, Luds, thanks, bud. You were you were a great teammate too. You, you taught me how to play through uh, injuries and be tough. And I, you know, we taught so. you how to play guilty. I, yeah, so play dirty and aggressive and uh, and guilty and you know all those things. So I I, I thank you for that too. I'll I'll, expe it. I'll accept my or uh, be looking forward to my five sixty one to show up at my door, Mo. Thanks, man. You got it, buddy. See, See you later.